Did you know that as Christians, we are expected by the Lord Jesus to live with certain attitudes called the Kingdom Manifesto? Find out, would you, what they are in the following video. So tonight we're going to try to unpack the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5, right? It's a very popular, very familiar uh, narrative. Uh, most of the uh, Bible in the English language has the title, The Sermon on the Mount, or the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount, or the Beatitudes. Uh, when this took place, it wasn't really a mountain. It was a hill. It was a hill in the region called Chorazin. Uh, I was asking Joyce Leon when she was in Israel if she had the opportunity to visit this church called the Church of the Beatitudes. What the church implies is that these verses that we're going to unpack, these are real event. This happened historically. As a matter of fact, that church called the Church of the Beatitudes, it was built with eight sites. Each site representing uh -huh. each makarios, which is the Greek word translated into English as blessed, that we're going to unpack now, tonight. Uh, when we finished the last time in verse 25 uh, 20 of chapter 4, right? Mm -hmm. It says right here in verse 25 of chapter 4 of Matthew, large crowds follow him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. I've always said in order to properly interpret a verse, you must look at the verse prior, then you must look at the verse after. So in this verse 25 of chapter 4, the key words a large crowds. And notice how it transitioned into verse 1 of chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, there it was, the crowds, right? He went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And as I always said, everything is in the Bible, in the arrangement of it, when it comes to uh, the event, when it comes to the wording, the sentences, the paragraph, it's by design. So this is a continuation of what happened the last time in verse 25 of chapter 4. So now he was getting more and more and more people coming to see him because his fame was beginning to spread, right? So when it says in verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, these, these crowds involve not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles, not just the apostles, not just the disciples, but anybody and everybody within the surrounding areas mentioned in verse 25, Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and here is the keyword, beyond the Jordan. So when he saw this large amount of people, he decided mm -hmm. he was going to go up on this little hill Corazin. Why? It's not that he was separating himself from the large crowd, so that he could be seen and heard by everybody. There's a wisdom right here, and there's a revelation right here. The gospel or the Bible must be preached and taught on the mountaintop so that everybody can hear it. Mm. Right? You know, you don't preach the gospel. Uh, so to speak, in a place where nobody wants to go. Even John the Baptist, when you look at his ministry, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ as a forerunner in a public place like the river of Jordan, right? This mm -hmm. is very important right here. And then it says right here, after he sat down, his disciples came to him. It was customary for a rabbi to do his teaching by sitting down. Notice I hear yeah. the sequence of the events. After he sat down, then the disciples came. And this is very revealing because when he begins to uh, preach this so-called Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitude, the eventual target audience is not the crowds, it's the disciples. The disciples, this word translated into English, 
as disciples simply means learners, learners, right? So all of us here are disciples of Jesus Christ. The question we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis, are we learning anything about Jesus on a daily basis? And if we are, glory to God. And if we are not, we got to look inside. Do we really have the rights to profess to be a disciple of Jesus Christ if we're not learning anything more about him on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Right? So, although these 12 verses are entitled in the English Bible as the Sermon on the Mount, the actual Sermon on the Mount, it encompasses chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 of the book of Matthew. Mm -hmm. Chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 was the first extensive preaching and teaching of the Lord Jesus recorded by Matthew. And the reason he records it in this order, chapter 5, 6, and 7, if you look at the prior chapter, for example, he's trying to establish a point of view right here. If you go back to when the Lord Jesus first came into the public ministry, right, the first thing that he said was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So these Beatitudes, as part of this Sermon on the Mount that encompasses chapter 5, 6, and 7, Matthew recorded in this chronology to drive home a point. This is his first public ministry which was extensive when it comes to the preaching and the teaching and the target, the eventual target of the disciples, you and I. Simply define and summarize, these 12 verses can be called the Kingdom Manifesto. The Kingdom Manifesto. These are what are expected by the Lord Jesus of you and I today. <clears throat> These are the attitudes you and I should have. This is why it's called the B attitudes, right? So in verse 2, he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, that word began was not in the original Greek. In fact, some older translation would put it this way. He opened his mouth and taught them, taught them, not not begin to teach, right? Why is this important? Because when it says right here in the Greek, open his mouth, it had the connotation of a solemn moment that what he's about to preach and to teach was so crucial, was so important that it demanded the whole attention of the people, of the crowds and particularly the disciples, and so must we. Because it's of this blessedness that he's going to proclaim to you and I. These are the evidence, the proof that you truly are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Lack or absence of this blessedness, it behooves you and I to examine ourselves. So far, so good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So notice when he was tempted by Satan, right? When he was tempted to turn the stone into bread. Notice how he responded. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out from the word mouth of God. of God. Now he's oh, opening goodness. his mouth. You see right there? Everything is in the Bible, in the sequence, in the order, for a reason, right? So it begins in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you so, count this word blessed, how many times did he mention this word blessed? Nine. Every verse. <laughs> yeah, every verse, nine. Every verse. Nine, right? Nine. But did you notice verse 11 and verse 12 are one thought. They are not two separate thoughts. Although in our English Bible, they're separated as two verses, right? And that you notice also the differences in the word. Spirit. You're going to notice a pattern right here. For example, verse 3 and verse 10. 
If you look at, drop down to verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a repetition, isn't it? Of verse 3, right? So what we have right here is a sandwich. A big, fat sandwich. Oh. If you look at the statement, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven in verse 3 as the upper bread, and the same statement in verse 10 as the lower bread, in between are okay. all this yeah. meat, right? And there's a reason why he did it this way. And you're going to see as we unpack this, right? So first of all, to be poor in spirit, that basically means to recognize that you and I have nothing good to offer God, that you and I are spiritually bankrupt, that you and I are born sinners, that you and I have nothing to contribute to the kingdom of God. But it is the people like these that he's pronouncing the blessedness. That word blessed right there, as I said before, in the, in the Greek, makarios, right? It simply means to be in a state of being right with God, to be in a state of being in harmony with God. A lot of the English Bible will replace the word blessed with the word happy. That's not really the correct translation because happiness, as you know, fluctuates, right? It changes. A better word will be joy because happiness is conditioned. Joy is from the inside. But the word blessed right here, it has the connotation that you are in such a state of being right with God. And because of that, you have this joy you have this love, you have this peace, you have all this fruit of the Spirit of God being produced from the inside of you automatically. So this word blessed here is very important, right? And the idea is that if you recognize, realize, acknowledge that you are born sinner, that you're spiritually bankrupt, that you have nothing good to offer God, the Lord is saying you are in the right state of relationship with God. And he's saying to you and I right here, if you are that way, in attitude at that, the kingdom of heaven is yours right now. Notice the English word right here, is, present tense, is. You see, the world teaches that we are born good. The Bible teaches we are born sinners. Which one are you going to believe? If you believe what the world teaches you, you're going to be arrogant. You're going to see no need of you of God. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. You're going to be proudful. You're going to be God to yourself. Uh -huh. You don't need Jesus. Uh -huh. And notice right here, these proclamations, this kingdom manifesto begins from the inside. Begins from the inside. Right? Paul tells us, that we, as a human being, we consist of the body, the soul, and the spirit. And notice how the Lord began this teaching. Blessed are the poor in spirit, body, soul, spirit. Because later on, he's going to close this teaching. that has something to do with our body. Keep that in the back of our mind for now, okay? So far, so good. Any questions? Moving on, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Notice, it did not say they are comforted. It says they shall be. So it's a future promise, a promise that will be fulfilled in the future. What is the idea? This word mourn, it doesn't mean crying. It means grieving. It means wailing. It means grieving and wailing over the state of sinfulness, the bankruptcy of our spirituality. If we realize, if we recognize, if we embrace being spiritually bankrupt, the Lord Jesus is saying the next attitude should be you grieving, you wailing over the discovery that you're spiritually bankrupt. And he's saying right here, if you do have this attitude, you're going to be comforted. By the way, this word comforted in the Greek, it has the connotation 
it has an illusion of being comforted by the Holy Spirit. How do I come to that conclusion? Because this Greek word translated as comfort has an allusion to this other Greek word parakletos. Parakletos means the Holy Spirit. So the Lord Jesus is saying, if you recognize, realize, acknowledge, embrace the biblical truth that you're a born sinner, that you're spiritually bankrupt, the next attitude should be you will be mourning and grieving and wailing over this spiritually bankrupt state that you are born in. And if you are, my Holy Spirit will comfort you. The sequence of this blessedness proclamations is very important. Check the next one out in verse 5. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Other English translation use the word with me. So the next right. attitude the Lord is saying is once you are wailing and grieving and mourning of your spiritually bankrupt state, he's saying right here, it's going to cost you to be meek. What does it mean? The best uh, understanding of this word meek uh, is like a stallion. It's like this particular horse that comes from Italy that's called stallion. Very strong, very powerful. Yet the power of this horse is under control of the master of the horse. That's the idea of the word meek. Meek does not mean weak. Meek means your power is under control. By who? By the Holy Spirit. Right? And notice I hear the promise. If you are under control by my Holy Spirit, the Lord is saying, you're going to inherit the earth. Have you noticed by now, from verse 4 to verse 5, with the use of this word shell, and the mention of this phrase, inherit the earth, there is an end time theology pace to this, right? And it's going to become clear when it gets to the last pronouncement or proclamation of the blessedness, why this has an end time taste to it. So far, so good. Okay, moving on. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Notice so far three times, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, shall. It does not say are. What that means is all these promises are going to happen in the future, right? So if you are under the control of my Holy Spirit, says the Lord Jesus, you're going to want this righteousness with God. You're going to desire, you're going to long, you're going to look for, you're going to cry for, hunger and thirst. These two words, you know, on a natural sense and literal interpretation mm -hmm. of this word, hunger and thirst. No human being can live suffering prolonged hunger and thirst, can they? No. You may be able to uh, fast for 40 days and 40 nights, but you're not going to be able to live long if you don't have an intake of water because, you know, science has proven that our body itself comprised of, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, maybe even 90% of water, right? But the whole okay. idea is the Lord is using a common day terminology, like hungering for food and thirsting for water. And he's infusing into this common day terminology, spirituality. He's saying, just as you hunger and thirst for food and water, if you just refocus that hunger and thirst to righteousness from God, he said, notice what the promise right here, you shall be satisfied. You will not be lacking. Which is better for you and I to experience on a daily basis? Hungering and thirsting for food and water or hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Well, this is better. For righteousness. righteousness. Right? Especially right. in the condition of our nation right now with so much injustice, right? With, uh, oh. you know, a double standard with the justice system. You see it every day, right? We have a president right now that's being put on trial for a mumbo-jumbo stuff, oh. right? 
So the Lord Jesus is saying, can you not see now the progression of spirituality so far right here? If you're poor in spirit, right, you're going to be grieving, uh -huh. mourning, wailing over that condition. And if you do, it, it's going to cause you to be so controlled by my spirit to where you're not going to be easily agitated. You're not going to be easily irritated, even when it comes to injustice, even when it comes to unrighteousness. But he's saying right here, you should make your number one goal, number one priority on your daily living to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And if you do, he said, you're going to be satisfied. You're going to be satisfied, right? So, so far we've gone to the first four. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Poor in spirit, mourning, being meek, and hungering and thirst for righteousness. Have you noticed right here? This first four blessedness proclamation. These four are in regard to having a heart right with God. Personal. Personal heart being right with God. Because the next four is regards to our heart being right to other human beings. So the first four. It's the condition of our heart being right to God and with God. The next four is with other human beings. Joseph? I have to go back to verse three, if you could. Sure. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I know you said the what the poor in spirit were, but it didn't gel with me. Okay. Can you say that again? Because are you saying poor in spirit being people who are like nothing and and they you know that they're open to the spirit that they don't have the spirit yet in some way it is that way in another way it's spiritually bankrupt in the sense that you're not realizing that you as created by God for example, according to the book of Genesis, right? There's a part of us that comes directly from God, the breath of God, right? In the New Testament, it's the Holy Spirit that's promised. So being spiritually poor in this case, it means basically you realize there's nothing that you can offer God when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, when it comes to your own spiritual walk, your spiritual identity, but at the same time, it has the connotation and illusion of what you're talking about right there, being open to receive whatever the Lord Jesus has to offer, whatever the Bible has to offer, whatever God, the Creator, has to offer. Which is very okay. good. Right? Is that is okay. that helping? It helps. I guess I would feel that I am more blessed if I am filled with the spirit. Yes. Then being blessed, being poor in the spirit. So that was the block <laughs> I was having. Yeah. So let's plus plus this up. Like this is a great question. Suppose there are nine billion people in this world right now. Have you not noticed that half of the 9 billion population of this world, that they're worshiping all kinds of spirits that are not from yeah. the biblical God? And because of that, their understanding of spirituality, right, is not correct, is not biblical. And because of that also, having worshipped all these other gods, men made at that, all these other spirits, that do not come, so to speak, from this biblical God. Their understanding of spirituality is completely different than what the Lord Jesus is presenting in the gospel, so to speak. Notice he began by preaching. When he began to preach, I should say, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he came with this mission to set people free from all this other spirituality that they have worshipped all these other man-made gods from, on all these other theologies from, that cause them to not see the difference within the good spirit of God, biblical God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and all these other mumbo-jumbo gods or spirits. So what you're saying is they are blessed. 
They're blessed in the sense that if they would recognize that they're spiritually bankrupt and have an open mind, an open heart, and a teachable spirit to what he's going to present in this three chapter, five, six, and seven, his first extensive public teaching and preaching. He is saying, if you approach me with an open mind, open heart, teachable spirit, despite the fact that whatever spirituality you have adopted, they might have caused you to think and believe that you don't need God, that you're self-sufficient, that you're not born a sinner, right? Making wow. sense. You're going to be blessed, uh, Lucia. So you're saying if you're spiritually bankrupt, but you want to know God and you want the spirit of God, that's the poor in spirit. Yes. Okay. Okay. That you makes are going to be blessed because of that. Right. But if right. you suppose you were you were alive during this time and you were one of these crowds and he began to teach this beatitude and you stood up and said, I don't need you. Because I know more than you do. Because my God is more powerful than your God. Jesus is saying, you're not poor in the spirit. And because you're not poor in the spirit, you're not going to be blessed. Why? Because you've already approached me with a narrow mindedness. Your mind and your heart were already closed. Right? Marianne? So basically what it is is you're blessed, you're blessed if you acknowledge that you were brought into this world as a sinner and you do have this sinful nature. And so if you recognize this, then you're blessed. Yes, because what that implies is you are open to his teaching. Right. You are open to receive from him, right? Remember this word oh. blessed. It means being in a state of right with God. So right from the get-go, Jesus is saying, a lot of you in this crowd, he's saying, you don't realize you were born sinners. For that reason, I came. But if you approach this teaching with close mind and close heart and no teachable spirit, you're not going to be blessed. On the other hand, if you approach my teaching with open mind, open heart, and teachable spirit, recognizing, realizing, admitting, embracing you are born sinner, you are not in the, in the right state of relationship with my Father in heaven. And if you would receive this be attitude, he's saying, you're going to be blessed. Not only was he that you're going to be blessed according to this first promise, the kingdom of heaven is yours, but all the succeeding promises, right? Especially right. when it comes to the fact that the first four are about having your heart right with God, the creator God. Mm -hmm. And then the next four are about having your heart right in your relationship with other human beings. And if you can't have your heart right with God, you're not going to have your heart right with others. That's the truth. <laughs> right? It's very simple, very basic. Right? I think what tripped a lot of us is, as, as Josie was uh, asking the question, right? In our Western mindset, when we read this verse in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. We, we, we look at that and we process that and we interpret that with our Western mindset. There's a contradiction right there. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> and it's the yeah, word poor. Yeah. It right. is. And it's right. the word poor. And when um, I first learned the Beatitudes, uh -huh. I got rid of the, in my mind, I got rid of the word spirit. I... I, this is the way I learned them. And it's probably just not the way it was taught to me, but the way I learned them was, okay, the poor, they're going to have the kingdom of heaven. So it'd be, it's the poor, not yeah. poor in spirit. I just like got rid of that spirit <laughs> out of, you know, it's like, what is this? I understand. I understand yeah. all I <laughs> so, so this is how my mind worked when I first learned these nine. 
it, this is how the Western mind processes. Yeah, things. exactly. Now, to prove that we are right on the track when it comes to processing this, I'm going to change the wording in this first and see how you're going to embrace it very quickly with no problem. Ready? Blessed are the rich in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to have problem receiving that teaching, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is where the difference yeah, of the Western perfect. mind and, yeah. The, yeah. and the Eastern <laughs> mindset. Because we're right. poor, it's pitiful. Yeah. We don't want pitiful. <laughs> we the, want to <laughs> They were poor trips of thinking and processing and interpreting process. Right? Yeah, it really did. <laughs> yeah. Making sense of yes. uh, Yeah, it makes yeah. a whole lot more sense because that's why I knew I had to stop you because you had already gone through four of them and I was still confused. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah to be honest with you, the proper way to teach this is one proclamation at a time because there is so much in each and every of this blessedness proclamation right but so we're trying to we're trying to get a big picture put it this way right because to, to really do that what i mean by that is to really teach this first by first right we really have to get to the the nitty-gritty of it put it that way historical cultural literal Greek word study and even uh, Aramaic uh, uh, study because the Lord Jesus spoke Aramaic. Contrary to the popular belief that he spoke Hebrew, no, he spoke Aramaic. So notice right now in, in verse 7, now it begins, the Lord Jesus is teaching you and I, once you know how to have your heart right with God, the Creator, now it behooves you to develop this rightness of your heart with other human being. Notice he said right here, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The idea here is once you recognize you are born a sinner and you begin to mourn or for your sinfulness, right? You're going to become meek. And if you become meek, you're going to be, be determined because of that to want to pursue the righteousness of God. And if you do that, you're going to develop this compassion for others. That's powerful. Notice, right? I always say, do not be quick to form an opinion, a judgment in your mind about other people mm -hmm. unless you walk in their shoes. Mm -hmm. That's compassion. Compassion Amen. is putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes, right? Because the gospel tells us later on in the succeeding chapters of even the gospel of Matthew, you're going to come across this phrase, because of the compassion he has, he healed them. Because of the compassion he has, he raised the dead. Compassion simply means is, is pityness in action. Sympathy in action. There's a big difference between you saying to me, I sympathize over you, but there's no action as evidence of your sympathy. Marianne? You know, it's funny because when we were, um, Saturday, when we were at June's place, I noticed that Lucia had particular compassion for yeah. all these ladies that were June's friends, because I noticed that she went and spoke mm -hmm. with each woman. Yeah. And that made, Lucia, that made a huge impression on me. Wow, I thank thought, you, Marianne. That's well, very I nice. Thought, thank this you. is very, very cool. She mm -hmm. is, you know, I need to learn from this, actually, because, you know, she went out of her way to greet these people, talk yes. to them for a little bit, and that is compassion. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that, they really appreciated it. They told yeah. me. Yeah, that is so sweet. Thank you, Marianne. That's so sweet. Yeah, as I said before, compassion is sympathy or pityness mm -hmm. in action. You don't just talk about it; you actually are doing it, right? So that's the, that's the first condition of our heart in dealing with people, whether Christians or non-Christians. The Lord Jesus is saying, you must, as my disciple, 
as my followers, you must have compassion for other human beings. Why? Because you already experienced my mercy. That's what he's saying. In what way have we experienced the mercy of God? Had it not been for the mercy of God, you and I wouldn't be here tonight talking about the Bible. Right? Have you noticed there's a difference between grace and mercy? There's a big difference between God gracing you and I on a daily basis once we wake up in the morning till we close our eyes in the evening and His mercy, which is anew every day. Does anybody here know the difference between grace and mercy? Mercy is, is God gives us mercy, right? Grace is something that we we get when we put something into action. So uh, grace is unmerited uh, favor. Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Yeah, you don't have to do anything. The word grace in Greek, charis. Charis means free. Free gift. Charis. Grace. So grace is God giving you and I what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving you and I what we deserve. <laughs> You and I deserve to be separated from God for all eternity because of our sinful nature. But he withdraws. He holds back the judgment. That's mercy. Grace is he giving you and I every morning, every morning, that the dawn of every morning, that you wake up from your sleep. That's grace. At the end of the day, that your life is not cut short accidentally, tragically, horrifically, that's mercy. And if you are in the habit of extending mercy to other human beings, the promise right here is very simple. As you are merciful to other human beings, so shall you receive mercy from my Father in heaven. There's a correlation here, right? Because you and I have experienced mercy from God. Think about it. I just turned 60. For the first 40 years of my life, I was living for myself, for the world, for the devil. Yet God was merciful to sustain me in those 40 years without bringing down the hammer of judgments upon me. When I look back, I mean, I could have got into a horrific accident from all those drinking. That's mercy. Now he's gracing me. Is it always, do I always get it right every day? No, here's a witness right here. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say that because that's the reality of our life. We are to progress spiritually. And this is one way to progress. Notice the sequence, admitting, embracing, we are born with the sinful nature and tendency. You're not going to hear this kind of teaching and preaching on churches this day. Most of the churches will teach you and preach you to feel good. Am I right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is very dangerous, right? So, so far, so good, yeah? Uh, Joyce? This is kind of a rabbit trail, but reading these Beatitudes, it makes me think of, these are Jesus's words of how we should be and, and how you should act. And you think of the religious wars over the centuries. What, gave, what gives leaders the <clears throat> idea or the, uh, you know, that they can, they can kill people and massacre people in the name of Jesus? I mean, it's, I just very don't get scary, it. Very scary, very yeah, scary it's thought. It's very clear how you, how you are, <clears throat> how you are blessed. How you, yeah. Uh, live yes did you notice in this teaching a reflection of his own life mm -hmm. by the way mm -hmm. that the son of god came down from his kingdom domain heavenly spiritual at that supernatural to be limited confined in a human body blessed are the poor he became poor so that you and I can become rich spiritually. And then when we get to the last blessedness, he died 
a horrific death of Roman crucifixion for you and for me. This is a teaching that he lived out himself. If you were to tell me, uh, is there a good summary of the Beatitude? A good summary that all of us here can write down and remember simply is this. The Beatitude simply is loving with Jesus, learning from Jesus, living for Jesus. Loving the way Jesus did, learning from him who to this teaching is clearly a prophetic reflection of his life. And then living it out for Jesus. Because you and I are his disciples. You and I are his followers. You and I are to be his witnesses of a life that he exemplified. So these beatitudes have been misinterpreted and mistaught and mispreached a lot. Some even have the audacity to preach this in the wrong way, saying that if you don't produce all these things, you're not, so to speak, a disciple of Jesus Christ in the sense that what the Lord Jesus is telling you and I right here, all these promises attached to every proclamation of blessedness is automatically yours if you just live out your identity as my follower. But there are preachers and teachers of the Bible that have twisted his teaching. Turn it into a theology of works. You see now why it's important to interpret the Bible correctly. For example, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Some have the audacity to twist that truth into the teaching of theology of work and say that if you don't do mercy, you're not going to receive mercy. So that's a promotion of the theology of work. The Lord Jesus is saying, if you're my true disciples, you will automatically have compassion for other human beings. Why? Because you've already received my mercy. By the mere fact that you call yourself my disciples, that's the evidence that you have received my mercy. Now extend that. That's what he's saying. Right? Marianne? Well, I can tell you um, the way I was taught is totally different than the way you're teaching this. Um, actually, when I was taught, uh, like Josie said, they didn't really hone in at all on the like uh, verse three for the spirit. It was just, you know, if you help the poor, meaning people that don't have any money. If you help the poor, then you will go to heaven. And then the one who mourns, if you don't cry and wail for Jesus, who was on the cross, if you don't do that, um, <laughs> you'll never be comforted. I mean, this is how I was taught. That's not what it means. No, I know now. <laughs> <laughs> and it just and blows my here, mind. Right? Yeah, yeah, it just blows my mind. Yeah. That they get away with with that. Totally wrong. Yes, I can I can give you the biblical proofs that they were teaching you wrong. As in regards to helping the poor, the Lord Jesus himself said, the poor you will always have with you. As it regards to crying for his uh, uh, suffering on the cross, Jesus Christ on the way to be crucified said to the group of women that follow him, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Unbelievable. It is. This is yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. very sad. It's very unfortunate how people have been deceived because of misinterpretations of the Bible, right? Yeah, and we were taught if we didn't do each and every one of these things the way they interpreted it for us, it's, you know, you're going to hell. That's it. <laughs> you can't be saved. You're done. <laughs> Don't even try. It doesn't even help if you go to confession. Nothing. <laughs> You're no. doomed. Oh, I mean, how yeah. awful to teach kids this because you're so uh, impressionable and you're so 
you just feel guilty all the time because you can never, <laughs> ever attain. Never. You cannot never. on your own. Right. right. As a matter of fact, what you just said right there, you can never, ever attain this on your own. That's right. poor in spirit. Right? right. You don't do these yeah. things to become a Christian. You do these things because you are a Christian. Yeah, see. Oh, wow. Just opposite, oh, wow. right? But that's a good that's a good commentary on your part, right? And then you are a living witness of what the Lord Jesus promises. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? Mm -hmm. So moving on. Right. It says right here, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What this word pure means right here is unadulterated, unadulterated, uncompromised, single-minded, if you want to put it that way. So what the Lord Jesus is saying right here, once you make your heart right with God, and you develop this compassion, sympathy, and action for others, you're going to be single-minded in your heart toward other people. You're going to be less concerned about yourself, but more focused about others. That's what it means right here. And he's saying if you do that, you're going to see God in people. You're going to see God in events of life. You're going to see God in circumstances that you're facing through, whether good, bad, or indifferent. That's a gift. Seeing God in daily circumstance is a gift. A lot of Christians, they cannot see God in their circumstance. Why? Because they are not single-hearted. Because their heart is not pure. Their motive is not pure. Right? The Lord Jesus says, if you give like the Pharisee, what good does it do? Because the Pharisee give expecting to receive in return. The Lord Jesus said, if you give without expecting, that's through giving. Because the motive has to be pure, right? Mm -hmm. Which would you rather have? To have a friend that tell you what you want to hear? Or to have a friend that call you out? That's pure in heart. We would rather have friends that would call us out, right? We should prefer to have friends that will call us out, mm -hmm. right? So far, yes. so good. So the next one, he said, if you are single-minded in your heart with your motive and intent, you're going to become peacemaker. You're going to want to reconcile with other people. You're going to want to bring unity. You're not into dividing people. You're not into causing strife. You're not going to make a big deal out of little things. And if you do that, he said, you're going to be sons and daughters of my father, the creator God. So now... I you're that see one down, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the word peace right here, it does not mean absence of quarrel, absence of dispute. The peacemaker right there has a connotation of wholesomeness, wholesomeness. What that means is if you see somebody, for example, uh, is not right with themselves, right? Being a peacemaker, I mean, especially since you already are pure in your heart, you're going to be compassionately approaching that person, reaching out to that person to help them to see what's causing them not to be peaceful. And in so doing, you become a peacemaker. It's not just the absence of strife, contention, quarrel. It's you want to bring unity. You want to bring wholesomeness. You're not into contending. You're not into arguing. You're not into making a big deal out of little things. Are we living at a time right now people are making the big deal out of little things? <laughs> yes. Not sweating the small stuff, right? Yes. No need to do that. If you're right. focused, if you're focused on being a peacemaker, those little things are not going to get to you because you're too busy, caught up and consumed into being a peacemaker. It is the people that have too much time with themselves that are making a big deal out of little things, <laughs> right? 
So notice the next thing that's going to happen to you if you become the sons and daughters of God the way that God defines it. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here is the bottom bread or upper bread, as I talked about before, this big fat sandwich, right? Notice the progression, having your heart right with God, then having your heart right with people. And it is costly. Because if your heart is right with people, you're going to find opposition. You're going to have people that's going to make a big deal out of you. It says right here, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. This goes back to what it says right here, hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the last element of you being a true disciple of Jesus Christ in making your heart right with God is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then you transition your heart being right with God to other human being. And the result of you doing that devotedly, committedly, faithfully, and obediently, you're going to find opposition. And if you do 10 out of 10 chances, you're going to be persecuted. It's a given. We're living it right now. The Biden administration is tracking down people who are buying Bibles. This is a prophetic fulfillment of this verse. Simply because you want to live your life right, you go to buy yourself a Bible to learn from the Bible, but you're being tracked down by the very government that is supposed to be protecting you, supporting you, Marianne. Are they tracking the people that buy Korans? Anybody who spends Probably their not. credit card buying a Bible is automatically tracked down. Did you know that uh, in the recent news, there was a prominent individual uh, who had an account with Bank of America? And simply because that person is conservative, patriotic, and Christian, his bank account was shut down suddenly. Wow. Yes. I'm not making this up. You can Google it out yourself. But you, you can buy a Koran and nobody tracks you. Yeah. But don't you dare burn it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. We we see such a discrepancy right now. We see such a disconnect between the government that we have, right? Compared to a long time ago, the way that this country was founded, so to speak. And this is the kind of persecution the Lord Jesus is talking about. And it's just going to get worse if God does not intervene, if you and I do not do the right thing, the right thing in the sense of standing up, standing up as Christians, right? Notice it says right here, persecuted for the sake of righteousness. If you see things unjustly done to somebody, <laughs> and you being pure in your heart, you hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and you want to make things right for that individual, you're going to be persecuted. That's what it means right here. But notice the promise right here. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Right now, presently, at this time, you don't have to wait till you die, the Lord Jesus is saying. Just as the first promise, poor in spirit. If you just realize, recognize, admit, embrace that you are born a sinner, the kingdom of heaven is yours for keeps. The same thing with being persecuted. What the Lord Jesus is saying is this is the surest evidence that you are my disciple. You are being persecuted. But he's saying if you are, take heart. The kingdom of heaven is yours for keeps. Oh. Discipleship is costly. There was a German pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was executed by the Nazi simply because he refused to do what the Nazi wanted him to do. And at the end of his life, so to speak, he wrote a book. The thesis of the book is simply this. Grace is costly. There is no such thing as a cheap grace of God. Right? So 
Moving on to the last two verses. Notice there's a change of the target of the audience. If you remember from verse 3 to verse 10, it says, The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the gentle, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Check the change of direction right here. Blessed are you, the disciples, the church, you and I, modern day followers. When people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So now he moves when it comes to the cause of persecution from for the sake of righteousness to because of him. And he's telling you and I, when they do that to you, when they insult you, when they persecute you, when they accuse you falsely because of me, rejoice and be glad. Why? He gives us two reasons in verse 12. Because your reward in heaven is great now, even as you're being insulted, even as you're being persecuted, even as you're being falsely accused, your reward is already waiting for you in heaven. That's reason number one, you should rejoice and be glad. Reason number two, he said, because the prophets who prophesy about me, they were persecuted the same way you are persecuted. Meaning, you're not alone. It's very easy for any human being to profess he or she is a Christian. He or she is a follower of Jesus Christ. He or she is a disciple. The evidence of you being a true disciple, follower, and Christian at that. Do you have all these things in your life on a daily basis? Are you poor in spirit? Do you mourn over your sinfulness and your sin? Are you meek, gentle, compassionate, merciful? Is your heart single-minded? Are you a peacemaker? Are you being insulted? Are you being persecuted for righteousness? Are you being persecuted because simply you believe in this person called Jesus Christ? Are they accusing you of all kinds of evils? He said, if you are, welcome to my kingdom. Yeah. Notice, right? It, it begins with the spirit, poor in spirit. It ends with you being persecuted, put in jail. You're physically persecuted, oh. mentally tortured, physically tortured. Relationally persecuted, spiritually persecuted. But if you're not what you are on the inside, you cannot be what you should be on the outside. Your heart must first be right with God before your heart can be right with people. And if you make it that far, way for persecution. The life of Jesus can be summed up in three words. Credo, cross, crown. Without the cradle, there will be no cross. Without the cross, there will be no crown. It's the same principle to you and I. Every one of us here has the cradle because we've been born. But not every one of us here is willing to go to the cross. And if you're not willing to go to the cross, there will be no crown waiting for you. The way to the crown is through the cross. The cross in this case is persecuted for righteousness, persecuted simply because you believe in Jesus. If you notice, you can talk to anybody about God because everybody has a definition, interpretation, understanding of God. But you cannot talk to anybody about Jesus because Jesus is offensive. <laughs> wow. And they'll be quick to quote Jesus' own word. And he'll tell you to your face, where 
The reason I don't like you, Christian, is because your God, Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> they interpret that statement as inclusive. When in reality, when Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he intended that statement to be exclusive. What it means is anybody who is willing to accept me as the way, the truth, and the life, I'm welcoming them. They interpreting that as inclusive just for you and for me who profess to be Christian. This is a problem of Western mind, <laughs> interpretation and understanding the Bible. <laughs> Can you not see now why it says back in verse 2? He opened his mouth and began to teach. The Greek here has a connotation of a solemn moment. A truth is about to be imparted. Very important at that. The kingdom manifesto. If your life does not manifest all these things, you cannot claim to be a part of this kingdom. The kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. How this kingdom of heaven is manifested is through this beatitude. <laughs> you know, what you just said really um, hit home for me when you said, you know, you can talk to people about God all you want and they don't have an issue really with that but as soon as you mention the word jesus everybody's up in arms it's like i don't know i just i don't i this is a problem i've had forever you know why what do what is the big deal? What do they think Christians are going to do? Why do they persecute them? What What is it they're, they're afraid of? I don't <laughs> Great get that. Question. Great question, right? Yeah, right. That, shows to, that, that goes to prove these people are very ignorant of the Bible. Because the name Jesus simply means God will save. Because when Gabriel appeared to Mary and told Mary she's about to have a child, Mary says, how can this be? Right? And then the angel Gabriel told her, you shall name him Jesus. And she asked why. And the, the angel Gabriel said, because he shall save his people from their sins. So the name Jesus means God saving you and I from our sin. So if people have a problem with that, what that tells you, Mary Ann, is they're not poor in spirit. They don't see themselves as sinners in need of salvation. I just had a question. Um, isn't Jesus in every Bible? He's in the King James Version. He's in the, he the Hebrew Version, the Greek Version. So it would be just the Jewish people who claim that he was a prophet. And whatever the Muslims think of him, I believe they think he was a prophet. They do. So... Why would everyone else feel alienated or feel strange to hear about Jesus? Yeah, because of the Lord's statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. So in their minds, in the minds of the Buddhists, in the minds of the Hindus, in the minds of the New Ager, they think and believe that Jesus is not the only way. Jesus is not the only truth. Jesus is not the only life. Okay, I forgot about all those people, the Buddhists, the Hindus. Yeah. Yeah, I of, forgot. The... Yeah, think of Buddhism. Buddhism has some weird teaching. The whole goal of you being a Buddhist is so that when you die, you end into nothingness. What's the point of living then? <laughs> if, if your whole goal in life is to be nothing, you might as well just not become something. <laughs> I'm sorry that it sounds, you know, mocking, right? but that's the truth. If your whole goal of being in existence is to be nothing. You might as well just not exist. That's Buddhism. So, <laughs> yeah. 
Yo sé. <laughs> so is that why we have all these ministries? Uh, I have a good friend who went to, um, who, who was part of a, a called Operation Something. And he spent like 10 years in South Africa teaching about Jesus. And then we have people that go to, um, to India and to all these other countries. And they have their own Bibles, I'm sure. Yeah. So it's got to be really, really hard for a Christian to try and to try and convert them and how do they and and I don't know that's a whole nother um part of being a Christian that is hard for me to under it's it's hard I, I understand it I know why it's important but yeah. for me to do that would be would be way beyond my capabilities, at least at this point. Yeah, that's a gift. To be a missionary is a gift, right? For example, Hudson Taylor, the British missionary to China. When he was in China, he would dress like a Chinese. He would learn the Chinese language so he could teach them the Bible in Chinese. I hope the preceding video has been a revelation to you regarding the Kingdom Manifesto. And I pray that by the grace of God, you indeed are living it up so that the kingdom of God is manifested daily in you, through you, and by you. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. And God bless.